Thank you. My brief is to talk on uh, uh, when and how to use technology for balancing virus and valgus. I think I'll take this opportunity to guide or show my journey on using technology over uh, last 20 years. I think the use of technology in arthroplasty, you can call it as non-essential use. It could be because of patient demand or it could be for minor deformity. It could be for marketing. It is obviously all, all your choice. This is kind of a non-essential use. If it is for a significant intra-articular deformity, it could be complementary use. You can still do a good job without technology, but still, you know, it is complementary. But some complex deformities or severe extra-articular deformities is absolutely essential use of technology. And I think that those are the three criteria in my mind or three varieties of uh, technology usage in arthroplasty. I think this image, I think, is for anybody who is just getting into arthroplasty where you have to really imbibe in because these are the three steps of any deformity correction. One is distal femur cut based on the... Uh, alignment or the you know you're having your cut perpendicular or to the mechanical axis or whatever variations we'll talk about it in a minute second is tibial cut which is always always perpendicular and maybe a small variations with the newer alignment techniques coming in now and the third step is intra-articular intra-articular balancing medially and laterally so these are the three uh, you know basic uh, uh, if you would divide the surgery into three basic steps, these are the three uh, basic steps for extension balance. Flexion balance will also depend on the femoral rotation. So alternative balancing strategies and what are the variations we'll discuss in, in a few minutes. We know that TKR, uh, you know, TKR fails in uh, outliers and uh, you can see that tibia that is a virus tends to fail in about five to seven years time. And th these are the kind of failures that you've seen over a period of years and we know uh, uh, outliers are bad. The evolutions of technology, basically navigation came into India around 2003, 2004, and it was basically optical. A small, uh, you know, attempt was made in electromagnetic, but it creates it created its own problems. So it's, uh, you know, had its own death. And then there are handheld systems with uh, accelerometers and gyrometers that we have even uh, available today. And those came about uh, in the in the last five to 10 years. So this is the optical navigation infrared. Here is a picture from 2004 when I was trying out my you know, brain lab uh, uh, navigation. And this was wedded to a particular system of implants. But then our hospital went ahead and bought uh, the Medtronics navigation, which was actually an open platform navigation. And that allowed any implant to be used because it was open platform. Well, I'll just show you the details of that. So I, I actually started using navigation using conventional instruments. So I would not, I would still put in my inter femoral intramedullary rod, put the pins obliquely so as to miss those that intramedullary rod. And this in fact helped me immensely to uh, for improving my conventional surgery technique as well. I could actually see on screen what is going on. And uh, you know, this is a validation of uh, the, the cut after the cut. And this is the kind of graphic that it would show me on the screen. This was in 2005. And here I'm, I got a zero degree, that means I'm per cut perpendicular to the mechanical axis. My femoral component is in three degrees of flexion. I've cut eight millimeters from medial side, uh, 10 millimeters from the lateral side. So uh, that is the kind of information that I got on the screen. Tibial cut was again perpendicular. I was using conventional uh, instruments. I was putting pins so as to miss the leave space for the conventional tibial jig and uh, validating with the tool. And this is the information here again. Again, you can see I'm cutting perpendicular to the mechanical axis, seven degree posterior slope because I'm using LPS here. And so minus 13 of defect on the medial side and seven millimeters based on the lateral tibial plateau. So this is the information I was getting on screen. There was also an option of doing freehand distal femoral cut without opening the medullary canal that obviously would reduce the bleeding. But that obviously was fiddly. This was the kind of screw that one could put in in the intercondylar area and uh, do this freehand technique. And uh, obviously, rotation also was, uh, you know, being uh, judged based on uh, you know, this pedal that I would put in the jig. And uh, here it is showing me uh, what is my external rotation with respect to the posterior condylar axis. This is uh, the kind of rotation. It had the options of all three uh, axes that we use for judging the rotation of the femoral component. And then I would... Uh, Then on the screen, on medial lateral balancing, this actually gives me a dynamic uh, picture in, in each degree of flexion. And this is the final screen that I get. And here I'm stressing medially and laterally in varus and valgus. And it is telling me what is the kind of laxity I have. For example, at zero degrees, it is two, de two millimeter laxity laterally, one millimeter medially. So this is the kind of picture that in a, this is the open platform and this still would give me all that information. So it was immensely useful, uh, you know, when you are managing with these uh, deformities. 
So especially when you had these complex kind of cases, you know, malignant femur fractures, you know, you obviously had to use technology. And uh, you using that, you know, we could manage many of these cases. Uh, as you can see, the alignment is achieved, the, the, the mechanical axis is uh, achieved. Uh, or you want to do it totally without uh, removing the implants. And that was possible uh, because of this uh, navigation that we're using. And that is the post-operative exit. Then I think in around 2015-16, we had eye assist that came around that was based on accelerometer and gyrometers. And obviously, it was very attractive concept because it was no capital investment, disposable system. There was small learning curve and it was quite good. In fact, the first uh, eye assist we had tried even before it was approved in the USA. So probably for even before the USA usage, we had this uh, try being tried here at our center. And initially, they had these four parts that had to be used. They later on modified it to two parts. And that is uh, how uh, we had the console and that would tell us. That was the femoral uh, cut being done with uh, eye assist. And uh, that is the kind of information that you get on the screen and also on the pod. And similarly, on the tibial side, you're getting that information. Uh, and obviously, you could decide whether you want it at zero degrees or you actually want to leave the implant in one or two degrees of virus or valgus or uh, other situation, maybe. So what ISIS gave us was distal femur cut and proximal tibial cut plane. It did not tell us the level of resection that was in the surgeon's hands. The balancing, there was obviously no question of balancing here because that system doesn't allow you that. It's kind of a limited navigation that uh, similar to what Nilayan showed us earlier in the day. Uh, it did not give us the rotational alignment. The graphics were not there on the screen. And it gave us nothing uh, other than the two cut planes. And that is basically getting uh, you know the, your coronal plane uh, alignment. So what was good was the no capital expense, disposable, line of sight, no line of sight issues, no watching the screen, very quick registration. And now today, we, you know, we have arrived at a scheme where we have robotics, which are either imageless or CT based. Uh, you can either have completely automatic or it is robotic assistance. You may have haptic feedback or without haptic feedbacks, but you are able to plan your cuts and get the balancing done. Now, we have in our hospital, we have been using uh, robotics for last uh, uh, year and a half now. We have done more than 500 in our hospital now. <laughs> and uh, we've been pretty happy we are using Mako robotics. And the three core features of Mako is uh, enhanced planning, jo dynamic joint balancing, and the haptic guidance that it gives us on the screen. Now, this is the kind of workflow we have. We have a CT-based system. So we have to have, get the CT done the previous day on admission uh, and the patient's uh, then planning is done. Then the OR setup and array placements. So I'll not go into the details of that. But it is a dynamic joint balancing, which is the exciting part because you know what we are looking at is uh, this is an extension. So the gap should be 17.9 and it will display as say 18 millimeters on the screen. Similarly, in flexion, we are aiming for 17.5, uh, uh, which shows that 18 millimeters on the screen. So we are 18, 19 is our magical number that we are aiming for on the screen during surgery. So just to show you one example, significant virus deformity bilaterally. This is the left side. This is on uh, after registration. Perhaps I should uh, come. <clears throat> Maybe you can uh, see. This is uh, in full extension. The limb virus is 24 degrees. Uh, if you can see my cursor there, pointer there. Uh, laterally, it is 21 millimeters. So it is stretched out on laterally. Medial side is only four. So it is a fixed virus and it is a significant, uh, you know, uh, medial tightness as well. So this, what we do is we put uh, curved osteotomes uh, in the joint space, both medial and laterally, and distract manually, and then look at the screen what it shows us, and that is uh, in the information that we register on the screen. The same thing is done in flexion as well. This is the uh, screen in flexion. This is an 89 degrees of uh, flexion, and again, it's very tight. It's showing 15. That means it is because it is a sublux knee it tends to show a figure less than 18, and that is typically because the knee is sublux. And again, we put the curved osteotomes in the joint line, distract the joint, and uh, look at what figures it shows us. Now, again, uh, after the, the techniques for virus and valgus collection remain practically the same, you still have the options of uh, doing the reduction osteotomy, doing the posterior medial clearance, reduction excision of the osteophytes. And after all that, you know, uh, uh, you basically are going to be aiming for this screen, you know, the lateral side. If you look at the four figures on the bottom here, uh, we are aiming for 18 or 19 millimeters on the lateral side and similar figure on the medial side that will tell us that it is balanced. The planned virus here is at 5 degrees. Now, I have a planned 3 degrees tibial virus, 2 degrees of femoral virus, and that allows me to get that 5 degrees. The current uh, limb virus is 3 degrees. And it uh, tells us that I'm going to be left with minus 2 defect on the medial side. And uh, similarly, on the right side, the same uh, information is uh, processed in extension and flexion. 
and this is after i do my balancing so these are a kind of screens if you look at the right at the bottom right bottom this is the kind of uh, information that we want at the end of the surgery we want 18 or 19 millimeters uh, on both sides and that is a well balanced knee uh, and that is a post operative x ray of uh, the same patient now again a peculiar case of extra articular deformity mahesh is talking on extra articular deformity so just to show you one case here that i had done this is a extra articular deformity that is in the almost in the mid shaft and uh, this is a, both coronal and sagittal plane deformities and this is the kind of image that it showed me uh, you can see you know, the graphic shows you beautifully that there's going to be a big defect on the medial side on the femur and it is 30 degrees of limb varus and a significant uh, laxity that is uh, left behind so i have to actually go for a much uh, higher uh, 16 mm poly so i'm barely cutting 5 mm from the tibia and distalize the femur as well so the, the, as just to show you intra picture there is going to be a, there's a big defect on the medial femoral side but it is going to be resting on the ledge here which is the cortex hard cortex so it's actually resting on the bone on the hard cortical bone so i I'm, they don't have to really uh, you know worry about that and uh, just to show you, that is the post-operative X-ray of the same patient. It's a, a line, and that is uh, just the close-up of the same. So this is. I thought we should shoot a video to show you what actually happens during balancing. And this is the video that uh, we shot uh, yesterday on Mahesh's case. And uh, yeah, just to show you, as you're starting, is the lateral side is uh, 19 millimeters. Uh, 20. So it is actually a fixed virus, but still quite tight lateral. It is not uh, stretched out lateral. So in flexion, it is 19 and 10. Lateral side is 19, medial is 10. And in extension, uh, basically what is shown is, is 21 uh, on the lateral side and the medial is only 9. So if you look at these, so if you look at these four figures at the bottom, now from this screen, uh, you basically start working. Uh, now, from, from this screen, you basically start working your implant manipulations. Now, uh, usually the first thing we do is, uh, you know, try and get this uh, both equal 18 and 18. And then we consider what to do in the medial laxity. So, we get the tibia first in virus, maybe go for 2 or 3 degrees, proximalize the tibia 2 or 3 degrees, and uh, distalize the femur, and then get both flexion and uh, extension spaces, uh, 18 millimeters or 19 millimeters on the lateral side. And then we, we can even change the rotation of the femoral component to get our flex, flexion balance as well. Suppose, you know, medial figures, there's a big disparity. We can actually external rotate the femoral component and that gets us uh, the flexion balancing as well. So uh, then I think Mahesh is uh, here distalizing the femur uh, uh, up the tibia as well. And uh, thereby, you know, but then all the techniques, uh, let me just move ahead a little bit. All the techniques, conventional techniques for virus uh, laxity correction or virus uh, deformity correction remain. <clears throat> yeah, so for example, this screen, here you can see that tibial component, you know, there's a big osteophyte still medial because it is an image a CT guided system. It gives you far more uh, details and it actually you have still have the option. See here, the femoral components and tibia both are three. I still have the option of going to size two. And that can actually lateralize the tibia and thereby having have a huge uh, osteophyte and the reduction osteotomy can be done on the medial side. And that will take care of my medial uh, you know, tightness that is being shown. So I think uh, just to show you that all the manipulations are possible during surgery. In fact, that is actually very important. And that, that is... Uh, that is how it is seen before uh, any reduction osteotomy is done. So to summarize, I think robotics does offer precise planning and implant positioning. It does offer, give you dynamic balancing and haptic feedback during surgery. So virus valve balancing strategies remain, but there is a potential uh, for reducing the soft tissue releases that may be necessary because you're manipulating the implant positions. And in fact, going towards uh, functional or kinematic or whatever name you want to give it, by doing that, by leaving the knee in maybe two or three degrees of virus, you, the amount of medial releases that are necessary actually reduce. And that obviously uh, should have a, a positive impact on the outcome of the surgery. So any deviation away from the neutral mechanical axis can certainly be easily planned. Thank you.